Without further delay, I'll be handing things over to Kristen. Thank you, Ryan. Welcome to MIT Sloan Executive Education's 27th webinar. Today we have 4,000 people dialed in. It's our biggest webinar ever. My name's Kristen Zecca. I'm a Director of Executive Programs in the Office of Executive Education, and I'm a lecturer in Work and Organization Studies at MIT Sloan. I'm also an executive coach, so that's why I'm particularly excited to welcome Cassandra Frangos here today. Today, we're gonna to have a chat about how you can get to the C-suite. Cassandra is a C-suite advisor, and she was formerly the head of executive talent at Cisco. She's also working with us to teach a new course this fall, helping you to chart your path to the C-suite. So welcome, Cassandra. Thank you. Today, we're gonna to talk about the different paths to the C-suite, which one is right for you, how you can position yourself for success, and be prepared to embark on your journey. So, Cassandra, you have a really interesting background and niche. The first question I'd like to ask is, how did you select this particular career path? Yeah, well, probably like many, didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but when I was little, I actually wrote a little thing when you're in grade school, mm -hmm. what do you wanna be when you grow up? And I wrote, I wanna help people. And it led me to, in college, double majoring in psychology and business. And that was really where I wanted to combine these two disciplines, where you can really think about someone's psychology, how they can be successful, how can they reach their fullest potential. So I just love this dual path of psychology and business from a very young age and just carried it through from my undergrad through my doctoral work and my career just sort of, um, has been really fun and exciting where I get to work with senior executives, CEOs, help them think about what they can do to reach some of their career objectives, which led to also the book. Excellent. Yeah. So welcome again. Thank you. Really excited to talk with you today and share all of your background experience with our audience. Um, so in your work and in your book, you note that there's four different paths to the C-suite. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through what those different paths are? Sure. Happy to. And in the book, I detailed the different uh, mm -hmm. chapters. So if you actually just want the cliff notes, this is the cliff notes of what are the four paths of the C-suite. Mm -hmm. And the first one would be pretty traditional where you think about staying in a company, growing up there, getting to the top through just even uh, promotions. You had a sponsor, somebody accelerated you. So that is something where the tenure track, which I call it in the book, is really the first path. The second is you reach a certain place in a company and you say, I really want to get to the C-suite. And for whatever reason, maybe you don't see the path, it's not coming. Um, and so you really get to a certain place in the organization and you say, I wanna become a free agent, want to actually get promoted at the top in another company. And so the free agent path is really where you start to then say, let me put my name out there, let me get recruited, and I'll get to the top that way. So that's that's the second path. The third is um, where you say, I'm gonna chart my own territory. And at MIT, you see this all the time, Kristen, mm -hmm. where people say, I wanna be an entrepreneur. I wanna start my own company. So maybe they've reached a certain place in a company and they say, I've gotten the rather great experience. Now I'm gonna go start my own company. And uh, that's really where the entrepreneurial path comes in. And then the fourth is a bit a non-traditional or maybe something you can't always control. Um, it's the leapfrog path. And that's where you would mentioned I came from Cisco. And when we did the CEO succession from John Chambers to Chuck Robbins, that was a leapfrog succession where there was a layer of management between John and Chuck. And so he leapfrogged over uh, and became CEO that way. And there's many examples. Leapfrog succession is actually becoming more and more of a trend. Boris Gersberg at Harvard has been a lot of research on this, but it is something where the leapfrog path is something that lots um, are seeing come into fruition in boardrooms. So the le leapfrog is becoming a trend. What is the changing landscape in the C-suite? Yeah, so the changing landscape is a lot of uh, flatter, more dynamic organizations. A lot of CEOs are looking at how many direct reports do I want? How much control can I really have in the organization? And lots of 
CEOs now are saying, I want to flatter, more direct reports, more ways of thinking through how can I have the pulse on technology, how can I have a pulse on the business. So they're not creating layers uh, that might be a barrier, um, but also, as you know, the digital economy is, is changing everything where um, C-suite executives are having to become much more digitally savvy, much more um, up in terms of how the business is rapidly changing and evolving. There's no really one right answer to this anymore. It's just becoming much more dynamic. And then also the way people are working in teams is becoming more dynamic. There's just, uh, this is an exciting time, I think, to be in business and be in the C-suite. Also a lot of pressure. Um, lots of C-suite executives are feeling the pressure where they've never done a lot of this before or they've never had this much transformation happening in their business or the competitive landscape is changing. Amazon became a competitor for some that never thought that they would become a competitor. So all of that is just leading to lots of dynamics changing. What about the roles? Are there different roles than we saw, say, 10 years ago in the C-suite now? Definitely. Uh, so there's some, the chief digital officer is one that never was in the C-suite. Um, so that's a combination of thinking through information technology, the uh, chief technology officer sort of combining all these different pieces in the technology space. Um, also, the chief operating officer, depending on the CEO, mm -hmm. sometimes they're saying they don't need the chief operating officer where they want more of the flatter structure. So they're not having a chief operating officer. That's also very dependent upon what the organization is going through. If you have a highly strategic CEO, they might say, I need a chief operating officer. Um, but definitely the, the chief digital officer. And marketing has changed quite a bit as well. If you're a chief marketing officer and don't understand the technology trends or thinking about digital, then you're probably going to be an irrelevant chief marketing officer as well. So there's, and there's probably more positions that we're going to see over the next few years that might not have existed. The other trend is the uh, chief people officer or chief human resource officer. Sometimes that was buried one or two levels below. That is now always a direct report to the CEO, which is great because given our business, <laughs> yeah, um, our yes. <laughs> yes, the people business is so critical. So that is something we're really just happy to see that that's uh, consistently been elevated. So it seems like there could be some new opportunities emerging in different areas for leaders. Absolutely. Yep. There's, you could look at someone who's just out of college today or just graduated from MIT and say, what could my career unfold? It could be countless of the different things that will change by the time they're in the C-suite. So that brings me to my next question. Um, any advice on how the audience can best position themselves for the C-suite? Yeah. So first is uh, make sure you understand what your brand is mm -hmm. in the organization. And what I do for a living is really assess executives uh, and constantly doing 360 degree feedback on executives when they're getting ready to be promoted or getting ready to be CEO or in the C-suite. And I'm often surprised just how much people don't take stock in their brand mm -hmm. and know, well, they're very much seen as an operational executive, but to get to the C-suite job, they need to be seen strategically. So um, really taking stock of your leadership brand also having a mindset of agility, reinvention, that's very important. And then the other is just making sure that you are stating your ambition. Mm -hmm. Women in particular will not state, I want to be CEO or I would love to be the next CFO. And if you can just state your ambition and make sure you have the right sponsors around you who can really help pull you up and make sure that you're getting the right exposure, mm -hmm. Um, and then control your destiny in terms of looking at your experience currently and then what you need to do to get to, let's say, CFO is your path. Mm -hmm. if, you're not, if you're in a public company and you're not dealing with investors or don't really understand how that all works, you have to make sure you're getting the right experiences. Or if you really want to be a CEO and you've never really held a general management position, mm -hmm. that would be important to think through how do you get to general management positions, so charting your own experiences mm -hmm. as well. Some, as you know, a lot of the 
uh, people you interact with here at MIT, they might say, well, is somebody charting this for me? Or um, will, mm -hmm. will this get spelled out for me, A, B, C, D? And chances are not. You'll have to chart your own path. So you're having 360 conversations with lots of executives who are coming to some new realizations about how they're being perceived in the organization. What type of advice do you give someone when their brand isn't what they thought it was? Mm -hmm. How do you, how does someone change their brand? So it's being very deliberate and thoughtful about changing their brand. So if you're going from, let's say, we'll pick an easy example. If you're going from being seen very operationally and you want to be seen a bit of a blend of strategic and operationally, making sure that you're getting those experiences mm -hmm. so that you can re-alter your brand and ask for help around you. So if you've got a few trusted sources that can help give you feedback or you can take your own pulse of, well, how am I being perceived six months later, a year later, year and a half later, just know that change in your brand doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to be very thoughtful and deliberate and making sure that you are rounding yourself out to have that brand change that you're mm -hmm. looking for and being very explicit with people. When I see, when you see me doing something that's too operational, yeah. <laughs> or if you see me doing something that's not on brand that I'm trying to accomplish, tell me. So feedback is a big part of the process. Definitely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If you don't get feedback, uh, you know, if some executives who don't end up in the C-suite, they don't value the feedback as much, or they say, I haven't necessarily sought after the feedback. That's always a question that uh, I ask in my work at Spencer Stewart is asking at the end of the assessment, so what, what do you see as your strengths and development areas, or what feedback have you gotten lately? And sometimes they'll say, I haven't gotten any feedback in a long time, or I'm not really sure what people would think, or I'm not really sure what my development areas are. That's usually a red flag. Okay, so that brings me to my next question. What are the factors that enhance or detract from one's chance of success in the C-suite? Yeah, so if you think about um, enhancing success, mm -hmm. I've used John Chambers as an example already, but if you think about his success, and he's this is very well um, documented and he will talk about this openly, so I'm not sharing any of his secrets, but he said that um, what was helpful for his success is he reinvented himself every two to three years. Mm -hmm. So he would really look, take a look in the mirror and say, I don't know that I've done enough around understanding the global economy. And so let's say 15 years ago, he went on this crusade to really make sure he understood global economies. Now, after he's left Cisco and had a great succession story and has had great success, he's helping startups around the world. Mm -hmm. um, so he's continued that reinvention of himself and made sure that he stuck with what is he trying to do in terms of his own learning and growth. The other attractive uh, piece to making sure that you can get to the C-suite mm -hmm. and also make sure you accelerate your path is knowing the right team to have around you. So if you have strengths in operations and you might need a visionary strategist, make sure you have the right team around you. And someone that you and I work closely with, Duncan Symester, <laughs> he'll always say he's a great uh, strategy and marketing professor here at MIT. Mm -hmm. When he teaches strategy and when he um, helps executives think through how to get even more strategic in their own leadership, he'll say none of that counts if you're not a great communicator. Mm -hmm. And if you're a great communicator, that's a lot of what the C-suite job is, is you have to take that enterprise view, you're thinking about how to communicate with all different stakeholders. You've got employees, you have uh, shareholders, you have investors and analysts and customers. So thinking through accelerating your own career path by really investing in your own communication capability mm -hmm. is important. And then the detractor, the second part of your question is if you have too big of an ego mm -hmm. or if your ego is not in check, your earlier point of what's changing in the business world, what's changing with the dynamics, um, there's not a lot of room for large egos anymore. No, we're certainly seeing at MIT, when we teach our teaching leadership, we're talking about cultivating and coordinating organizations um, and helping organizations moving away from uh, a top-down traditional structure that's been ingrained in the past. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and there's all kinds of research now of to get CEO or C-suite 
you have to be really comfortable saying, I don't have all the answers. Because a lot of times there's lots of research where first time CEOs are actually very successful because they're willing to admit, I don't have all the answers or I just willing to say, I don't know that. And so I'm going to get the right people around me to make sure they know it, mm -hmm. or they're humble enough to say, I'm just not sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's often where we find if you have a CEO who got to the position, but they have too big of an ego, chances are they didn't stay there. And I just assessed someone uh, for potentially CEO a couple weeks ago. And he said, I'm fully formed. I don't have any development areas. I, I just, I'm ready. And most people don't really have that answer that they always think there's something that they need to learn. Okay. So how did you coach this person? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm having this feedback session shortly. Yeah. And, uh, and what I plan to do is just really have him think through what does he need to do to really evolve his own leadership? And if he truly is, I don't need to learn anything or um, I'm, not, I'm not really willing to reinvent myself, I'll just give him some data mm -hmm. and give him some facts of that might not be your formula for success as you think about your trajectory to CEO. Um, and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are the other detractors? Other detractors is being one extreme to the other. Um, so I've talked about this a little bit in our conversation thus far, where if you're too strategic, okay, absolutely too strategic, and you just um, can't figure out how to operationalize an idea or bring operations to the forefront in your own thinking, uh, mm -hmm. that can be a detractor. Or on the flip side, too operational, not thinking about the strategy enough, that can be um, a detractor as well. And then others can be if you're not willing to make some key decisions. Mm -hmm. um, we've all seen, in a lot of you on this uh, webinar today, you've probably seen a leader who they weren't quick enough in making the hard decisions mm -hmm. or they were not willing to make some of the tough decisions. And people decisions can be the hardest. And if you're a good leader, chances are those are hard. And um, I've never heard a leader say, I wish I kept this low performer in the position longer. Um, and it's just something where to move on a decision or even a business that might need to be divested or a tough decision that just is unpopular, but you know it's the right one, but you've taken too long to make it, that's another detractor um, in the C-suite. Okay, so to enhance the possibility of getting into the C-suite, be open to reinvention, yep. learning, um, creating a new you mm -hmm. as you need to, as you progress through your career, mm -hmm. knowing yourself well enough to know who you need to put around you on your team yep. and how you build your team, um, having a good balance of strategy and operations. Mm -hmm. yep. so these are all things that you need to think about yep. and not having a big ego. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, do you have any tips for us and for the audience from current CEOs or executives that you're working with that you can share? Yeah, I think um, along with this reinvention theme, uh, one CEO that I know, he finds a research topic uh, every, you know, every six months. And so it could be what's happening with uh, Internet of Things um, or what's the latest in terms of management disciplines and mm -hmm. the digital economy. So he's really kind of constantly thinking about how to learn, how to grow, and areas and topics that he's interested in. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one. Another is, uh, there was a great Harvard Business Review article on how CEOs manage their time. Mm -hmm. And as we all and everyone on this webinar probably struggles with that as well, of how do you manage your time when there's more and more information available than ever, and time is not endless. So thinking through how you're really going to manage your time is another tip that uh, one CEO that I work with has just even blocks out. I need to have some think time. I know I need to walk the floor. Um, and so he block off time to walk the floor and make sure that he's connecting with people. Um, the other is uh, get out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, one CEO I work with, she, uh, she's naturally introverted. 
And so she'll say, I need to just get out there more. I know I need to not just sit in my office and think through how I'm going to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. I need to actually grab a few people and work with them on it. And then the other is we're doing more and more virtually. I mean, I'd love to have all of you in front of us today and sort of put faces uh, with names that we see on the webinar, but we, it's a vir virtual world. So as we think through um, how to manage in a virtual dynamic, one CEO um, I have that I work with, and he says, I need to really think about the people that are report to me that are not in front of me all the time and mm -hmm. not to have people get on planes every week and so he's really thinking through how does he get better at managing the virtual and in-person dynamic mm -hmm. because as we all know if you have the person sitting in front of you it's easier to say let me run this idea by you or let me think through something with you versus oh i probably should call Kristen and get her <laughs> thoughts on this or let me get on a video or a zoom or webex or whatever it might be to make sure that I can get her thoughts. So how do you actively engage? And I know we work in a virtual environment at MIT yeah. um, in our department. And I know that um, using different digital tools to just get on a quick chat with someone or giving someone a call um, create, can create that level of engagement that you would typically have at the office. Absolutely. And being proactive about it because you don't want people to forget that you're as important as the person mm -hmm. that's sitting with Same them in New York them. or in California or Boston. So. Yeah, so so important. And on a on a personal note, we've talked a lot about what you need to do at the office. Mm -hmm. What type of support team do you need to have in place around and around you um, to outside of the office as a CEO? Yeah, it's a very stressful job. It is. How can people build up um, the right support network? Yeah, it can be a very lonely job, and many who get promoted say, "I didn't realize how lonely until I got there." So having, uh, I even talk about a board of directors that's been well written in research, but having a board of directors personally and professionally that you can really go to to support you. Um, so even a former CEO who's retired and say, I'm struggling with how to manage my time or I'm not, not great right now at managing personal and professional mm -hmm. and having someone like that to talk to. Um, the other is, uh, thinking through from a family standpoint, who do you need around you? And, mm -hmm. and family can mean many different things. Um, it doesn't have to be husband, wife, kids, children. It, doesn't, it can be um, lots of different things that you need in terms of personally. When we were doing the CEO succession work at Cisco, mm -hmm. the board would ask each of the CEO candidates, um, how will you be supported personally mm -hmm. if you get the job? And they all had great answers, really. They all said, well, my spouse would be, or my best friend, or mm -hmm. my, um, my CEO advisor. Uh, so they had really thought through how would they be supported personally mm -hmm. and professionally. And um, then the board would ask a follow-up, so is your family ready? <laughs> you know, are they really ready for you to be uh, all in and working a lot of hours in the beginning? Now it could taper off as time mm -hmm. goes on, but um, so that was an important question that the board really thought through, and we talked a lot about it. Um, and then one that I love, the, the board asked um, all of them, who's your first phone call when you get the job? <laughs> That's a great and, question. Yes, and, uh, and Chuck Robbins was my mother, Oklahoma, my mother. So, you know, just sort of want to know the human side, of mm -hmm. course, um, which, is, which is just a great dynamic that's changing in the boardroom and also um, for C-suite executives where just the whole person is important to think about personally and professionally. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We've gotten a lot of good information and advice from Cassandra. I'd like to change gears and take some questions from the audience. So please know we're going to address some of your unanswered questions that we're not able to get to in a blog on our website, executive.mit.edu. And I see the first question coming in. Cassandra, are there any shortcuts to the top? Shortcuts? Mm, no, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, it takes a lot of hard work and planful. Uh, you know, I get I get asked this a lot. Of, you know, is there anything that I can do to shortcut things? Could I just get promoted to CEO right now? And um, unfortunately, there's no real shortcut. It takes a lot of um, 
perseverance. Mm -hmm. um, when you've been turned down for the promotion a couple of times, that doesn't mean you're not going to get to the top. There's some great C-suite executives that I talk about in the book that um, in a private moment, they'll tell you that they were turned away for their promotion a few times and they stuck with it. They worked mm -hmm. on their development areas or they didn't get the dream CEO job, but mm -hmm. they got CEO somewhere else. Um, so they didn't necessarily get to CEO of their current company, but they made it uh, to CEO of some other company. Mm -hmm. So sometimes uh, things happen for a reason as well, where it might not have been the right culture fit for someone or mm -hmm. There may not have been the right support around them to get to the top. So there, there is a lot of hard work and perseverance that has to happen. So unfortunately, like <laughs> one of the uh, premier qualities is tenacity. Yes, absolutely. To get to the top. Absolutely. Um, and keeping, keeping learning and keeping to develop it yourself yeah. and not losing hope. Definitely. Staying positive. Definitely. So we have an interesting question. Tell us about the most surprising scenario you've ever seen in your work. So let's see, the, um, the Cisco CEO um, succession story that we've talked about um, was surprising in a sense it was a leapfrog succession story where you could say there were a few that um, were maybe uh, contenders, but Chuck Robbins was the surprising but yet unanimous choice um, where did skip over the level and also um, he just had this fast acceleration in his career um, that was pleasantly surprising, which, you know, every big promotion, he just accelerated and did well. Um, another one that, uh, that I worked on is uh, CEO got appointed of a public company uh, at 41. Wow. Uh, and so the, the age is also becoming... Uh, not necessarily the biggest factor where it could be somebody who's 41 or somebody in their 60s, um, but it's also looked at in terms of how much growth and potential does someone have. So someone at 41 can show lots of great uh, potential growth, um, ability to expand, and they might do just as well or even better um, than a tried and true been a CEO three times over. Interesting. What's the average tenure in a C-suite? So there's, uh, there's some new research that's, uh, that's coming out that Spencer Stewart just did. And, and actually, if someone's been a CEO over 10 years, the performance of the company gets stronger. Mm -hmm. um, so CEO tenure is actually um, being studied and getting um, to be longer versus we think of you know, the stories we read, you know, sort of two, three years or four yes. years. Certainly that still is happening but we're seeing a correlation of the longer tenured CEOs show greater performance in yeah. the company. Perhaps the more experience, more knowledge of the market, the company, opportunity to build the culture, yeah. the confidence. Absolutely. It's interesting. Absolutely, because you think about if you're a brand new CEO, the first year you're trying to figure out your team, you're trying to figure out mm -hmm. how do I grow into this job. Second year, we effectually call the sophomore slump where <laughs> you know, you're know you listed and not hitting my stride yet. Third year, some things are coming to fruition. Fourth, fifth year, you're hitting performance. And then the market changes or the market crashes, and then you've got to reinvent. So there's lots of dynamics as you think about CEO tenure. Interesting. Um, another question from the audience. So once someone gets to the C-suite, how can they stay there? Yeah, um, so that depends, of course, on the situation, but uh, the biggest mistake is once you get to the C-suite, and maybe there's some that are in the C-suite that are on this webinar, um, don't sort of relax and say, great, I made it. I achieved my dreams. I'm, I'm here in the C-suite. You have to constantly be taking stock of your brand as well. Um, there's many that you've probably seen in your companies where you've, got, you've seen the C-suite uh, executive get there, and then they lost track of their brand, or mm -hmm. they weren't making changes fast enough or to the conversation earlier, they didn't make some of those hard decisions in the first year. And so they were really lagging in terms of the change and the performance of their organization, or they were too loyal to some people and they really needed to evolve and shift. So main point is don't just because you've made it say, great, I can relax. There's lots of turnover that happens in the C-suite and a lot of it is because 
people got there and didn't necessarily think about what's the change agenda I have to accelerate? What do I need to make sure that I am doing to reinvent myself? How do I stay on top of the digital trends? So there's lots of dynamics. So just, I would say, um, just because you got there, don't, don't say I've made it, great, I'm, I can go home now. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, before we wrap up, I have one last question. What's the one thing a leader needs to do before embarking on this path to the C-suite? Yeah, so in order to um, get to the C-suite, it takes a lot of work and you really have to make sure that you want it before you spend your whole career striving for something that you realize maybe I don't want it. Um, and at the end of the book, I, I talk a little bit about that, but it's really making sure that it's what you want because maybe, which we see at MIT, you see this all the time, someone who loves being in the details, someone mm -hmm. who loves the technical track. And actually the general management track may not be as exciting, mm -hmm. but for whatever reason, they keep shifting their career to the general management track, but they love the technical track. So just make sure that you really want it and it's what you're going to love because we spend a lot of our time at work. Um, and yes. so you really have to love it. You really have to want it and make sure you want it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. um, because there's lots of um, executives where they put themselves before the company. And that is also something that doesn't get you the great success. You want mm -hmm. to put the company above your own self-interest as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so you care a lot about MIT, and so yes. you're always thinking through MIT strategy, does this fit, and then you think about Kristen. Yes. So it's just a matter of making sure that you are got the right level sets and that you really want it for the right reasons, not just the title, because the title can be taken away. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, to, to really want it means that you want the responsibility that comes with it. Yeah. And that you want to put your ego, yourself, last mm -hmm. and really put the company and all of the people first. Yeah, absolutely. Again, constantly reinventing. Yeah. Putting the right team around you. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Being flexible, mm -hmm. being an excellent communicator are some of the things that are going to help you be successful in your career. Um, at, at all stages of your career, absolutely. as you build your path. Mm -hmm. So we hope that today we've inspired you to think about if this path is right for you, what some of your ne next steps might be. Um, any other words you want to share before we move to our final slides? Other than, uh, you know, all of you can achieve whatever you hope to achieve. Just make sure that you've got the right support around you because that is, to your question earlier, Kristen, that's so important. So if it's, I really want to be the technical expert, make sure that you've got people around you that support you with that, um, that you've got sponsors in your organization who can help you with your career objectives. Um, but just making sure that there's no right or wrong answer to any of this and there's no timeline, you, you set your own pace as well. So what's the right answer for you? Mm -hmm. um, so thank you very much. If you'd like to spend more time with Cassandra um, and spend a couple days with us, her course is happening in a couple weeks um, and we have four deliveries in 2020, Strategies for Career Development, Charting Your Path to the C-Suite. And during this program, you'll have an in-depth experience thinking about your own particular path. There's an assessment, a little bit of coaching. Um, so if this is something you want to spend more time on, please join us. And for more reading, I'm reading the book myself <laughs> um, and continue to have questions for Cassandra. Um, Cracking the C-Suite Code, really helpful, um, more in-depth answers to some of the topics we were talking about today to help you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.